the four of you are literally my my personal heroes. Um, I specifically want to call out Armando from CCAT, who's been doing this work for two decades and um, recently a national and a statewide funder reached out to Armando and said, I heard what you're doing in rural Fresno and I want to support you. Armando has a, a mobile van that he takes out to rural communities. He's connecting our families to the internet, to culture. He's helping kids take apart uh, robots and to play around with the, the things that fly up in the air, I forget what they're called. Um, but most of all, Armando loves our families and he literally, as soon as this crisis hit, has been going door to door asking people what they need. He's been delivering food to our elders. He saw that farm workers didn't have the protections that they need, so he started sewing masks for them. He went to the city manager and is fighting and advocating. And Armando is still only supported by one foundation, and that's us at the Latino Community Foundation. And we hope to change that uh, as soon as possible because we need to be investing in people who are closest to our family. Um, we also have Maricela Gutierrez, who is uh, literally a superhero from Siren. Uh, she has an organization that serves people in San Jose and Santa Clara County, San Mateo, but also in the Valley. Um, she is a fighter. She is a dreamer. Uh, she is also a visionary. Uh, when immigrants need uh, help, they call Maricela and Siren. Uh, fathers and families of San Joaquin, Sammy Nunez, if I ever feel down, I call this man because he pulls me right back up. He reminds me what my heart already knows is that we are powerful, we are strong, and we're gonna get through this. Um, Sammy has been, he's had a generational model since the day he started. He works with the young people, uh, with the leaders, and with the elders. And then Luz Gallegos, who always touches my heart, she's in the Inland Empire fighting for our families. She's been doing this work volunteer run for far too long. Um, she has helped 150,000 families naturalize um, to vote. Uh, they are active in the census, but more importantly, her community center is a place of hope, of love, of belonging. That's what all of our Latino nonprofits offer, is a place where people feel safe, heard, seen, and valued. So I'm going to turn it over to the four of you to get started. It is such a privilege to have you here and to see your faces. Before we ask you the questions about how folks are doing and what we can do to support you, I just want to ask you all, um, in one word, how are you feeling and why? Um, and Armando, I'll start with you because you're not on mute. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm a little exhausted. Uh, this weekend was a little tough for us uh, as we were going out to the rural areas and talking to people. but. Um, um, I think I'm doing okay. I mean, I'm okay. Thank you. Maricela, how about you? Can you unmute yourself, Maricela? Good afternoon. Great to be with Latino Community Foundation. Masha, the amazing Masha, thank you for having me. Um, I'm feeling determined. You know, I feel like it's an opportunity to bring our communities together to really mobilize. Um, it's allowed us to step back a little bit and be more with our families, um, communicate more over web, right, with our family members. And we've been checking in with our grassroots leaders and youth. So uh, we have a determination to get through this. Right. Sammy, what about you? How are you feeling in one word? One word would be, uh, first of all, buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Um, one word would be esperanza. Uh, Waiting for hope, loosely translated. We are the hope we've been waiting for. Thank you, Sammy. And what about you, Luz? How are you doing? To tell you, I have mixed feelings, um, but I'm very hopeful and very faithful. Uh, very hopeful because of our youth taking on the lead of so many campaigns and really stepping forward. Um, just very hopeful for our future generations. And uh, as with community, we're feeling really resilient because although community is going through so much, there's still very, there, there's so much energy, good and bad, that we're, we're standing strong. That's right. Thank you, Luz. So maybe Armando, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, so the first question is really, tell us about how uh, families are doing in Fresno, especially in the rural community. 
Um, how are they coping? What are the, the biggest needs that you're seeing, Armando? I think um, it, it's been a challenge for, for myself and a couple of other people that have been behind me um, for the last three weeks. Uh, well, one, let me go back just a little bit. Um, you know, one of the great things about our program is that we not only help the, the kids with all kinds of different um, programs that we have available, but we also advocate. Uh, I've been advocating since I was 14 years old. So um, I have a lot of ambassadors. I call on my ambassadors in different communities that communicate to me whenever there's an issue going on. And so quietly we go out there and, and try to help them out. In this case, um, I've been working a lot in the, I want to say is the southwest uh, side of Fresno County, which is the old, um, the most poorest areas in Fresno County. Um, a lot of dairy workers, farm workers. And we were notified about issues going on with the, the food distribution. And when we got there, we started noticing that a lot of um, farm workers were still packing or a lot of the raiteros, what they call the drivers to take the people to the, to the fields were um, having 12, 14 people in vans and, and, and taking them to the camps. So we did approach some of the farm owners and ask them if they have some sort of a, a, a plan to, to protect them and all. Um, I know we, they didn't. And as a matter of fact, they even called the sheriff on us. Uh, but we tried to talk to them. You know, we, we, instead of making a big issue out of it, we just said, you know what, can you, will you allow us to, to make some masks for the workers? And, and so we started calling our, our contacts, people that had sewing machines, um, and we started sending them the patterns. We started getting some fabric and what have you. Now, just this weekend, we turn in about 58 masks, and we're going to go back tonight and give another 50. Um, but we also saw there's, in, in one particular area in Mendota, um, there's a lot of children with special needs. And those families are having a really, really difficult time because a lot of the services is, are closed. They can't get um, services for their children. Um, and then we have large families living in trailer parks out there in Contua Creek and in San Joaquin. And so we're trying to help them, help them as much as we can. Um, we have land out uh, computers for those kids that don't have access to anything. We, um, some friends of mine, uh, lend me some hotspots so we can distribute those out there as well. We're working with the group called MUMI, which is Madres Unidas por un Mendota con Igualdad. Uh, there are wonderful ladies um, and they're helping us in many ways. Uh, we're working with the um, special ladies from the Catholic Church. Uh, they're nuns and they're helping us distribute food and a little bit of money that we've been able to collect in the last couple of weeks. I, I raised about almost $2,500. So we went and bought some uh, food and we gave them some money for the rent. So we're doing quite a few things. I mean, I wish I could tell you everything. Um, it's very exhausting when we come home, not for our work, but the emotional part. Thank you, Armando. It really takes on us. I mean, it, if, we're, if we're afraid, um, just imagine how afraid they are. And, and it's getting to the desperation point where a lot of people just don't know what they're going to do in the future. So sorry about that. Thank you, Armando, for being there. It means the world. Sammy, since you're, you're close in San Joaquin, um, do you want to share what, what you're seeing as the biggest needs in your community in Stockton and the county as well? Yeah, let me just start off by honoring our, our ancestor, uh, Cesar, uh, who we just celebrated uh, recently uh, in a very different way, and frankly connect that to my own experience with uh, and honor my, my stepdad, who uh, essentially helped raise me, uh, who was a farm worker, undocumented campesino, uh, and who recently passed away. And I can't help but think about uh, all of the undocumented people, families that, that we're connected to, 
uh, that have been having to practice social distancing for a long time. They can't go and visit their abuelitas, their abuelitos. Uh, my brothers and sisters weren't able to be at his bedside as he was. And this is a man who's worked his whole life since he was a child, uh, you know, here in, in, in California, mainly in Texas and anywhere there was farm work. Uh, and frankly, fed the world, yet we always had this kind of cruel irony of having some of the starkest kind of food insecurity. And as Cesar said, it is clearly evident that our path travels through a valley of tears, well known to all farm workers, because in all valleys, the way of the farm workers has been one of sacrifice for generations. Our sweat and our blood have fallen on this land to make other men rich. And that was clearly evident in his life, uh, where he died alone in, in a village in Mexico. Uh, without the company of his children because we couldn't, you know, there was just fears to travel. Uh, and this is the reality that uh, even in the most need, uh, the highest needs, the most basic needs, human needs, uh, as a human rights organization, we focus on the basic human needs that have been neglected our people. And it's not hard to see that we've been under a sort of pandemic here in our valley in the region. When you look at Stockton being the largest area to file for uh, uh, the, for the high, for, four of the highest metropolitan areas nationwide in homelessness uh, here in the Central Valley. Uh, and we're publicly recovering from financial crisis. So this is not new to us, the economic uh, kind of instability uh, and knowing that some people benefit uh, out of our pain and suffering. Uh, and our pain and suffering is reduced to a political and economic product. But the difference is that we're now on the, in the landscape with a, um, an urgent kind of uh, uh, immediate need to, to quell some of those fears that Armando was talking about. We're in, in Stockton, we're the most diversity in America. So we are constantly bringing the traditions and teachings of our ancestors, but also creating an innovative strategy to meet and, uh, and engage our community very radically different ways than has been customary, right? That the private sector refuses to do and the public sector cannot do, we step in and do that work and work with the most vulnerable. But again, I think that when you look at the pollution and the three of the highest uh, 10 zip codes with the highest uh, pollutants, air toxicities here in Stockton, the highest illiteracy rate uh, in the world, uh, actually in the nation, I should say, here in Stockton, the highest rate of incarcerating children in schools. This is the reality of young black and brown, Southeast Asian, poor white people in this city, in this, this region for a long time. It's very much like the regional inequity, right? And how do you reverse generations of, uh, of uh, toxic inequity? How do you remove the burdens and barriers of social uh, structural racism? Uh, and this is where we actually work within that crevice, within those areas, because to organize and mobilize in this community uh, beyond COVID, to flatten the curve of oppression and violence is really a long-term, long-distance kind of uh, plight that we have right now. Uh, the fact is that, again, we are the hope that our people have been waiting for. Uh, we have uh, about 70 elders, all over 70, 80, 90 years old, who are, are receiving uh, goods, what we call goods for the hoods, uh, elderhood, childhood, parenthoods, right? We're actually uh, meeting them in a different way. I'm proud of my team. I'm proud of our, our folks here in this agency. Many of them that come from the main line and now on the front line of this disaster and actually the city calling out to us, the state calling out to us and saying, how can you respond? How can we you know, leverage your uh, connections with the community to actually deliver the goods that are necessary that actually literally are gonna save lives. Uh, and so I think that our folks uh, have depended on us. We get hit up all the time. I was close with this story. I was on Friday delivering food to some of our elders and I was driving this, the van, the company van, if you will, right? Uh, old scraper van that we got on, you know, real cheap and stuff, but it's been really useful for us. And I'm driving in a little elder, a little older, el uh, uh, old, older lady, uh, elder lady actually pulls up in her, uh, in her wheelchair. And I'm like, what is she doing, you know? And she kind of like starts screaming something out. I open up the window and she's like, are you guys fathers and families? We need some food. It was just really like a real testament to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, healing moves at the speed of trust. Our community trusts us to show up, show love, uh, and give them a reason to live with purpose. And we're still doing that in the face of this COVID crisis. Thank you, Sammy. Maricela, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, trying to focus on Sammy's beautiful speech. <laughs> Thank you. I think, you know, there's so much, I, Obviously, from what we've just heard, there's so much going on right now um, for our immigrant communities, for our Latino families that 
um, the challenge has, we were rising to the challenge as, as Latino leaders, as leaders of nonprofits who are in the trenches really fighting the good fight and have been fighting the good fight for a long time. I think, you know, one of the, 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 I think one of the things that we are really proud of is that we've been building a lot for this moment. You know, a lot of us have set up systems in place to build a safety net. I mean, no one can imagine this situation, but we have been working hard to build a safety net to assure that people know who to go to, how to get there and who's there to support them. And so they, those phone lines are definitely ringing, you know, at this moment where people are reaching out to Siren and asking, you know, I just recently lost my job. My landlord wants to evict me. I don't know where to get food. Do I qualify for this stimulus check? Like all those questions are the resource, are the reason why Siren is here. Um, and I really love this quote by, it's on, on a poster that Ernesto Yerena designed by a Native American elder that says, we the resilient have been here before. And that is very true about our communities. We are strong, we're resilient, um, and we're unafraid and, you know, uh, about these situations because many of our communities have gone through many, many difficult times, uh, probably tougher than this one. And um, it's, we're seeing that coming out of uh, our grassroots leaders who are reaching out saying, how can I help by cooking food for people or young people that are now organizing, you know, their own webinars to hang out and, and, and get to know other young people out there and seeing how they're struggling together and how they can build together. And so what we're seeing is a lot of fear, obviously, um, especially for the undocumented community who are, as we're seeing, there's still deportations that are happening, targeted deportations, even during this time, during this pandemic, um, we have are making demands to the Trump administration and ICE that they stop all deportations during this pandemic. We're also seeing um, many of the folks that are undocumented or on the front lines, essential workers, which are all mainly immigrants that are you're seeing out in the workplace, are actually now being impacted by the virus. Uh, many families in Eastside San Jose, the, the numbers have just increased for Latino families. Why? Because they're on the front line working and they're being exposed. Mm -hmm. And so there's more education and resources that needs to be allocated to these communities to assure that they are protected and that the places of work that they're going to are providing the protection so these people can continue working and can continue surviving and thriving. Um, and then I think about individuals like my dad, right, who's a farm worker who's out in the Central Valley, Fresno. He's out in uh, near Visalia, near, near this small town called Ivanhoe today, uh, picking oranges. And so folks like that are not getting information. He talks about the farm workers are not receiving education on you know, wash the basic things, washing their hands, wearing face masks, none of that is being provided out on the fields. Um, people are sick, you know, sleeping in their cars for an hour and then getting up again and picking. And that's just the reality because there really is no other source of income. And because they, they work based on the weather, they have to work when it's sunny, right? Because there might be a rainy day tomorrow and there's no work. And so really thinking about who are those people that are falling through that, through the cracks that are not being, um, taken care of at this moment and how we as a community are the people that are going to keep each other safe and that we as Siren, as Fathers and Families, as Todek, as CCAT, as Latino Community Foundation, we are the ones that are going to be building those resources and building that safety net to assure that our families are taken care of at this moment. Thank you, Maricela. Luz, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, as you represent the Inland Empire. And what are you seeing as the greatest needs in your community, Luz? Yes, um, for those of you that know the Inland Empire, you know that we are a border region. So we've been, we're, we've been used to growing, you know, seeing Border Patrol in our streets. And so we've been used to La Migra, but we haven't been used to this crisis, to a pandemic crisis where us as, an organ, as organizations that are constantly in the forefront, in the trenches, um, not only organizing our immigrant community, but also figuring out policies that could really uh, defend our community and elevate the voices and the issues that are really grassroots um, led. So uh, with that said, uh, right away when the whole pan with the whole crisis started coming out and whatnot, we had to shift gears really quickly. Uh, we have a, a 1-800 um, information number that's 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 on 24 7 we have seen the i mean we've gotten we've uh documented over 5,000 calls um since 
it hit our region, um, specifically in the eastern side of Riverside County in the Coachella Valley, where that's a very rural community where we have our farm workers exposing their lives every day so they could um, feed the rest of our country. So we are seeing we're very worried um, as we continue hearing the, the needs of our community. Um, for the first calls that we started getting was, "What? Qué va a pasar conmigo? What's going to happen to me if I have to? If I get sick and I'm in walking in public charge? What's going to happen to me?" So this is the aftermath that we're seeing because of what we have lived in the last four years. Us as organizers, we thought we've seen it all, but no, we're still learning. So uh, what we have. Um, we have built up our organization the last four years to be ready and ready to go. Uh, como decimos, what, how we say it in Spanish, Mexicanos al Grito de Guerra. So this is our war in the community, but we're in the trenches. Uh, we're documenting anywhere from what's going to happen with my health. We're very worried about our elders, um, our undocumented elders. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here in the United States. We wouldn't have the opportunities that we have. We, we are calling all our electeds. All our community, all the people in power, we are privileged. I am privileged to have a you to be had born here, to have a job, to have health coverage. But we have to think of those vulnerable communities. The real vulnerable communities are undocumented communities. We are documenting the fear of going to seek health, where they will continue to rely on their remedios. Uh, although we are telling them and ad, and telling them their rights, our legal teams are telling them their situation, dealing with their legal situation or whatnot, and letting them know that their health is first. Because if we don't put our health first, we're never gonna see La Mica, because we, we have lost lives already. So it's hitting home, it hit home already. So at this time, we, are, we feel so desperate. We feel desperate because we are hearing our kids crying. We continue to hear fear from our elders. What's gonna happen to me? As we continue to push policy, not only at the state level, but also at the local level, but it's not enough. We need to act now. Um, we are, as an organization, we are shifting years constantly in these last four years, in the last three decades that the organization's been founded out here in the Inland Empire, we've been used to shifting years. But right now we are so desperate because we are trying to meet demand of the thousands of people that trust the organization, like all of us here, that are seeking for us to give them something what can we give them? We could give them what we have, but we really need government to step up. We need anybody that has power to step up because we are dealing with a very, very vulnerable community, which are the community that we advocate for, our undocumented community. That don't, if they get paid, paid off, they won't get unemployment. Nothing that's coming from the federal government is supporting them. Nothing at all. Right now, we continue advocating. I just came from the County Board of Riverside, the Board of Soup, for them to, to implement a, a countywide uh, moratorium for evictions. Right now, we are hearing a lot of things that are coming down from the state that's saying um, eviction relief or whatnot. But what's going to happen to those families that haven't had a job for so many months? How are they going to come up with thousands of money to pay that rent? We're going to continue to see homelessness. We are very worried right now, but we've been um, dealing with all these calls, dealing, we're trying to work virtually. We weren't ready from go from an office setting to a virtual setting. Um, we need so much support um, as far as technology, laptops, anything that can be donated. But right now we are just being there. We're very grateful for our team, for our staff, for our volunteers, because we are we are be we are being there for community. We get calls at two, three, four, five in the morning. People cannot sleep because of everything. They lost their jobs. Um, but we also see community coming together, those that do have jobs because the kids are at home. When, when it's going to happen with child care, they're coming together and support each other to take care of each other's kids. So we continue seeing all these traumas happening, even within ourselves, um, within our community. But uh, we are staying put and we're staying faithful because right now at this time, we the, what's holding us strong continues to be our faith. But I'm also calling everybody, we are some of us are very privileged, but let's not forget those that don't have the same privilege that we do. Thank you so much, Luz, for everything that you do. Um, for the folks that are on the line, I do want to say that our Latino Community Foundation Love Not Fear Fund will support the four organizations that are represented today, CCAT, Fathers and Families, Tyrant, and TODEC, but we need much more support. 
and we want to reach out to additional grassroots organizations in the Central Valley and the Inland Empire. So our goal is to, to raise thousands and hopefully millions of dollars to really address the, the immense demand that Luz is referring to. Um, my next question for all of you, we have a lot of donors, Latino Giving Circle members, funders uh, tuning in today. Um, what can they do to support you right now? Uh, and beyond funding, Luz, I know you just mentioned you need laptops. Can you give us some specific numbers? Like how many laptops do you need? We have a lot of people in Latinos and tech giving circles that work for these companies and it's time for them to step up and support our grassroots leaders. So give us some specificity too. If people want to send something to fathers and families, what should they be sending aside from money? Armando, I'm going to kick it back to you uh, to get us started. What can we do to support you? <coughs> There's so many things, but um, I'm really concerned about the, the, our elders. Um, you know, I, yes, as a matter of fact, the day that you called me a couple of days ago, I, we had just come out. Um, from a home that a gentleman who had been lived, uh, worked in, in a restaurant for almost 20 years, he was given his termination papers. And he reflected a lot like my dad, you know, like they'll keep their pride inside. And, but you could tell he was hurting so much because he kept saying that, that he didn't know what he was going to do for his viejita, for his wife. Because he, nobody was going to hire him anymore. Um, and because he didn't have a document that it was going to be a challenge, a big time. Um, it was going to be harder for him. So I, I, to be honest with you, I mean, anything that, that we can get to help them would be uh, awesome. That would be great. Um, I wanted to show you guys this picture too. Um, this is the other families that were not, even looking into, but this, I don't know if you guys can see that, but mm -hmm. um, there's a, a special needs children that a lot of the families are worried. They don't know what, what they're gonna do. Um, they can't go out because they can't be in contact with people. Um, those are also a lot of the families that we're working with right now, that they need a lot of help. Um, Luckily, you know, we've been able to distribute and give out or, or lend out some computers, some hotspots. Um, we're making a lot of masks. Um, and it's been great because a lot of people have um, contacted me to provide with fabrics. Um, we had four sewing machines, so we spread them out and other people are helping us with that. Um, anything that we can get to help those folks would be awesome, it would be great. I mean, I, you know, there's so many things I can ask for, but I think it's, it's just like Lou said, you know, we're working with the immigrant community, we're working with those folks that are undocumented. Those are the people that people are not even considering to help. And it's been, it's been hard. So any support from anybody from the Valley too? I mean, if anybody has any old fabrics that want to provide it to us, um, that would be great. I go pick them up. You know, I'm, I'm, I got one of my good friends gave me this thing to measure my uh, temperature, measure temperature, this is what we're doing. We got a whole bunch of little things going on right now. So, but yeah, there's there's quite a few things that we're gonna need, and I think it's in the next week or so it's gonna get a, even harder for us, for everyone here in the valley. Thank you, Armando. I, I do want to say that our SF Latina Giving Circle is gonna support you with another small grant, and uh, a lot of our Latino donors are rallying and and saying we need to shift gears and and really channel our resources to some of those rural communities in Fresno that will need it most. Um, Sammy, what about you? Uh, what do you need uh, funders to know, donors to know right now? Uh, what else does your organization need? Uh, how are the, the staff doing? Does everybody have a laptop to work from home? There's a lot of questions there. Uh, let me try to answer each one of those. But uh, first of all, I just want to uh, send some love uh, to our relatives in the Inland Empire down in Riverside. Uh, we feel it. Lo siento. Um, and it makes me both sad and, and upset at the same time 
because in our economy, we shouldn't live this way. No. In our world, in our state, what we espouse to be as a state, we should live up to those, to that espou those espoused values. Uh, and it's frustrating to see our people suffer needlessly. It's needless suffering that we see in our communities that we can actually quickly remedy. Now, I would say that uh, I would love our folks to give it like my sister just gave right now, liberally, uh, until it hurts, like living up to what philanthropy's root is, right, which is giving with love. We show up, show love, and give our people the reason to live with purpose. And I think we really want to our philanthropic partners to give till it hurts, maybe increase the amount of giving they give every year. There's only a percentage. The rest is in an endowment. I think we need to increase that right now, and I think we need to think long term. For us, I, I, I think it's really important that we get some unrestricted capital. We know how to put that money to good use and we can track it. We can account for it. We can account for every single dollar. There's pictures of it. There's where like, we're literally uh, you know, on this uh, on these front lines doing the work that needs to be done and saving lives. So how much do you, how much value do we put on human lives, right? So we need unrestricted capital. We need support to buy land. There's only 20% of Stocktonians and during every crisis, we've been through a crisis every single 10 years in the Central Valley. Stockton went through a bankruptcy, mortgage meltdown, went through, I mean, you just name it, for the last every year, every 10 years or so, we go through a calamity of epic proportions that's, uh, that's kind of relative to like a, uh, a kind of uh, a, 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 a calamity of, uh, that is like a natural disaster. So we need that kind of a response from philanthropy and the government and our local leadership. We need a, we need a response that is that adequate, like a natural disaster type of response, because that's what we've been seeing for the last 30 plus years, our communities have been under siege. And this just amplifies the vulnerabilities. Uh, and, um, and we're gonna try to do everything we can to save people's lives at the end of the day. But I would say that those are the kinds of things I, I would hope that our, that our philanthropy uh, partners are looking, and I've gotten calls from a lot of philanthropy, so let me just say that I want to appreciate all of those partners that we have that are doubling down and supporting our community. They may not live in Stockton, they may not live in the Inland Empire or Fresno, but they know that we're all interconnected, that all of us have sacredness, and that we're all going to get through this, but we have to take care of the most vulnerable right now um, to save lives. And so I think that uh, we need some, uh, we look at our resource engine very broadly, Masha, as you know. Our greatest asset is our people. So we're trying to figure out, making sure that we keep our people safe and protected. Um, we're, we're uh, especially those that are actually uh, delivering the goods for the hoods. For the young people, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of young people, families that are formerly incarcerated that have tremendous barriers. Um, and so, um, you know, we're seeing that there's going to be 3,500 people coming released in California. Guess where they're going to be released to Central Valley more than anywhere else? Because we lock up more people. We had more prisons built in the Central Valley along the 99 corridor. Most of those family members are going to come home to us. And we need to be prepared for that as well. So uh, that, that includes, uh, we want to buy up some land. We want to make certain that we're thinking long-term end game. Right? We have a campaign right now, Stockton Rooted, Stockton Reclaimed, Stockton Reimagined. If we're not careful, we're going to be the next, next wave of gentrified people. And where do we go from here? Uh, so it's really important that we're acquiring land, that we get some legal support, uh, that we get some amplification. We're in InfoWars time right now. Information is more important than ever that we have readily accessible, transparent, um, uh, accurate information for our families. Right, so if we have the information, we can be in formation to actually respond accordingly to this crisis. And so I think that um, we need uh, amplification. I know that I always reach out to Masha. I said, "Hey, we need to work on an op-ed piece here because there's despite all of this, let us be very mindful of the fact that despite all of these." conditions, indicators that tell you that, you know, they could have, <laughs> I don't know how we continue to have so much hope when we see, when you see the social historical institutional traumas that have plagued us um, historically for, for, for generations. And frankly, here in Stockton, we're starting to see that uh, our work has actually led to a decrease in violent crime. Is that to, we have some of the most progressive policies being enacted here. And that's because the ground game is actually moving the political needle. We need to continue uh, to think with the radical vision of the future and not let fear-based decisions limit us and restrict us and compartmentalize us. Uh, so I think that for us, we got to think um, beyond COVID. I mean, Maricela, how about you? I know you always yes, think it's thank you. <laughs> I have a few ideas on that. And, you know, thank you, everyone, for sharing your powerful words. I'm so inspired by being here today. Um, but just for funders to really 
understand that we are continuing, our work has elevated threefold with the same amount of funding. And so our advocacy efforts have really stepped up. Um, not only have immigrant rights been challenged and called to the moment when Trump came into office and we, our demand tripled overnight, now you can, you can add that layer plus this current public health economic crisis. Our, the demand on immigrant rights organizations and organizations here that are on this call has now quadrupled, right? And so really thinking about what is that funding source that or the funding sources that the current organizations are receiving and how do we elevate that funding to assure that these organizations that are on the ground have the opportunity to continue our advocacy efforts on a whole nother level, right? We're thinking about, you know, hiring digital organizers now versus just community organizers because it's hard to get out into the communities. Um, we're really thinking about case managers and case management and wraparound care. You know, a lot of the families are reaching out to us, asking us, where do I go? How do I fill out this unemployment? Am I going to qualify for the stimulus? And the reality is that they're not because they're undocumented and they've been left out of the equation. Or if there's one undocumented family member in that household, no one qualifies. So these, a lot of the changes that are happening policy on the policy level are, limit, are excluding our immigrant families and documented families. So the advocacy has to be stepped up, you know, even more. And so we need the funding to continue this advocacy that, that limits us, right? By phone, by, by web, by telephonic, all of this information. And then also just being mindful that um, a lot of the, the families that we're working with um, have limited access to technology. That's a reality, and I, I'm glad that you brought that up. Many, especially of our families that are in the rural communities, you know, in the Fresno County, Central Valley areas, have let us know that they do not have access to tablets. Or if they do need to go pick one up, they usually leave an hour away from their school. You know, it's not like they live really close to their schools, and so even picking up lunch or those free foods is not really accessible to families because either they're working, they leave their house at 4.30 in the morning, 5.00, and then by the time they get home, it's 4.35, 5.36. Um, so they really don't have the opportunity to go pick up lunch or they live an hour away, right? So really thinking about how do we bring resources closer to where people are at. And then also, you know, the census is happening and it's critical that we get people to sign up for the census. And so getting these tablets and getting young people and people that are looking for jobs right now um, to do phone banking from their homes and getting funding to organizations to be able to train people to do phone banking and getting them tablets and, and phones so they can easily, you know, rapid dial, text people um, to complete their census, which is such a critical uh, tool that we need to make sure that is completed during this time. And then on the advocacy level, you know, we're advocating for DACA right now. DACA, the Supreme Court can come out with a decision at any moment between now and June, eliminating DACA, a really vital safety net program that's provided you know almost 700 young people the opportunity to remain in this country free from deportation and provided them work permit permits we're asking the supreme court to delay their decision at this time we're asking the trump administration to automatically renew all daca permits and to stop the deportations that takes advocacy work that takes time that takes additional resources to make that happen and in addition there's people that are currently in detention that are being exposed to the virus we're asking to free them all. The people in detention should not be exposed. Actually, it's jails. It's immigration jails that they're placed in. And these people, these families with children that have been in detention for no other reason than a xenophobic government need to be released and out and free with their families. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. I want to let folks uh, tuning in know that the Latino Community Foundation has a list of resources that we've been compiling for Latino nonprofits, those foundations that are uh, taking applications. Uh, we put a list of those together. As many foundations, I know they're going to support their existing grantees. There are very few that are opening this up uh, to new partners, which is really important. We also made a list of resources for undocumented communities across California and have those up on our website. As we learn more, we'll update those. Um, Luz also uh, chime in specifically about tech and I'd love for you to make a call to action to our tech community because we do have a lot of relationships in that sector and we need to implore them to take action and to mobilize our resources and send them over to you. Take it away Luz, what do you need? Yes, um, first of all, um, as, you, as we know, the ones that live and organize here in the, 
in the Inland Empire Riverside San Bernardino County. Our counties have always been overlooked and overshadowed by LA, San Diego, and all the urban communities. So I'm very happy to see all our partners from across the state that are in similar situations. But um, as an organizer and being in it in the long run, um, it is it is very important for us to advocate. We advocate constantly for community, but as organizers and as CBOs, we have to adv also advocate for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, at this time, we are in serious need of unrestricted funding. Uh, we are in need. Uh, we we know how to make the dollar stretch because we we have to. You know, there, there's very limited resources. We're constantly on defense and offense mode, um, being on the ground, being organizers, organizing with um, what's happening with the constant attacks against the community, especially undocumented community, but also being on defense, organizing to make sure our communities are becoming U.S. citizens, making sure they're registering to vote, make, make sure they're participating in the census, and making sure that we're going to participate in redistricting coming up. So there is so much to ask. But right now, since we have been in crisis, and now we have to keep our team safe and also community safe, going virtual was, it, it's been a challenge for us. It's been a challenge for us. And not having the capacity, the technology capacity as far as laptops, we need 311 laptops. We have 311 volunteers, mostly youth, that are been working with us with the census before this. We don't have, we need them to work from home. We need, um, headsets, we need scanners, we need printers, anything that could be donated, but laptops, tablets is so essential as our, our call center is virtual and we can put so many people, there's calls coming in all the time. We're missing a lot of calls that we're, it's hard to keep up and we don't have people, we have the, the people power, but we don't, we need the technology to be able to meet demand of community. We're doing what we can as organizers thanks to our base. Um, but our base needs the tools. And we're also not advocate, not only advocating for our, our internal capacity as an organization, but also capacity for our community members. Um, I know in, in the Eastern Coachella Valley, all the way from Valle to Coachella, all those areas, our community doesn't have the technology. We have dead spots um, of internet. In the high desert of San Bernardino County, same situation, but different, different realities. So uh, it's very important that folks that, are, that have that power uh, to to invest in organizations like all uh, all of ours and other CBOs that are doing amazing work across the state to really talk to us and know what our needs are and that the needs really have to come from the grassroots that they have to be bottom up not top down because uh, right now we're in crisis if we that are in the trenches uh, talking to people every day hearing their needs seeing their reality seeing their fears and being there for them we know what we need. So rely on our expertise because we are the experts at the grassroots level. Thank you, Luz. I wish I could give you a big hug right now, but know that I'm sending it to you um, and that it's huge. Um, the last question that we have for all of you is, is around the policy change, the advocacy change, the structural reality that we need to think through as we support the immediate needs of our families and our elders and our young people. So crisis is an opportunity to organize and we're all organizers on this call. Um, what is your biggest idea for transformational change? What are the policy changes you want people who are tuning in to support and to push for and to even imagine, right? So um, Sammy, I know you talked a lot about thousands of people being re released from um, cages. Um, what can we do to support those young people and those fathers and mothers? Uh, what are some of those big policy changes that you're dreaming up right now? You know, I think that first of all, for us on the ground, I think that when we talk about organizers or, or, or advocates, is that we, we strive to reconnect disconnected people. And that's at the core of what we do. And I think that in order to understand something, you have to understand how it's connected to everything else. And I think that right now is a time where we can see our interconnectedness and our common humanity from LA to the Bay uh, and seeing the Central Valley uh, in, in a way that uh, really is a place that is under a revolution right now, right? With irreconcilable worldviews colliding 
And this is going to determine where California goes into the future, again, during COVID and beyond for agencies that work in a comprehensive way to reconnect around the, uh, the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual domains, right? So we can have the wisdom, so we can have the stamina, so we can have the courage, and so we can have the faith that is required, not just to survive and thrive within COVID, but to actually think of beyond uh, for, a, right? The future can heal the past. And that's what we're bent on right now. I would say the radical vision is just to actually double down uh, and, and support us uh, in ways that uh, I think uh, many of folks have mentioned right now. I don't have any specific things. I don't know I can tell somebody, hey, if you're sitting in the foundation, this is how you support us. I think you all, the foundation world knows better what they can and can't do. Uh, I'm glad we're able to kind of holla and uh, have a conversation about this. But the reality is, is that I think folks that are getting kind of, we have to shatter privilege uh, and we have to shatter this illusion of separation because uh, if we're struggling and suffering here, then that suffering is going to transcend our valley and our region and the rest of California will struggle and suffer. So we have to see that common humanity at the end of the day, I think we got to ask ourselves what kind of ancestors will we be? And I'll close with, uh, if I may, with Cesar, because I opened up with Cesar, is that he, well, he said that once a, uh, once a change has begun, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate a person that has learned to read. You cannot humiliate a person that has pride. And you can no longer oppress a people who are no longer afraid. And so I think it's really important that we have in the face of so much adversity, in the face of so much things that are fear-based kind of messaging that's coming out, I think we need to have a hope-filled message. Uh, and a real message and get the resources down to the ground that need it that we can put to quick, quick use. Amen. Um, Armando, do you want to chime in? And also thinking beyond funders and donors, thinking about uh, families that are tuning in from across the state that want to do something to support us. Any policy change, any, any asks or ideas that you have for them in terms of what they can do? Um, I just want to echo what Tammy said. Um, um, it's pretty much what I, I feel. Um, I think if we always talk about equality, this is the time that we need to to do something about this. Um, even in crisis like we're going through right now, um, you don't see that. You don't see the equality. You don't see the... We're, we got so many racial barriers that are continue to be uh, getting worse and worse and and we need to stop that um, you know my our experience in the last two three weeks we've seen stuff that we besides the virus and all that that i never thought i would see and 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 it's it's happening and i think way beyond the COVID 19 um we need to make some radical changes you know uh, we are equal we should be equal we should be the same. We shouldn't have no uh, color. We should be colorblind. We should be, you know, unite. Um, and that's all I can ask for. I mean, I'm, I'm going to continue doing my thing. And I know I'm getting older and my bones are hurting and everything else. But I, I think there's some great people out there. And I think if we all come together, we're going to be able to be successful. And thank you to you guys, too. Latino Community Foundation. I, I, you guys are my heroes. Uh, for 19 years, I've been doing it on my own. And because of some of the funding you guys have given us, I've been able to invest that in our community. So thank you so much. It is our privilege to invest in you, Armando. Um, thank you. Maricela, how about you? I know you spoke up about DACA and <laughs> census and... Um, what are you thinking and what are you feeling right now? I think we need to really think about the families and how we get resources to the families, um, working families and documented families at this time who are being eliminated from key services. Um, we need to, you know, plead to the governor to really think about how funding gets trickled down to these families. If someone has an I-10, if they're working, um, if, if someone in the family is, um, you know, undocumented, it shouldn't it impact funding that um, should be resourced uh, to them. And so policy changes need to happen as to who, who is uh, 
who is resourced and who is not at this moment and really thinking about who are the people on the front lines that are feeding us, cleaning our homes. You know, uh, there's a lot of DACA youth that are teachers, doctors, you know, um, that are leading the front lines of this work and who may be left out of the picture if we continue with the same administration that's eliminating, you know, undocumented folks from our country. And then I think it's also about um, how we, uh, you know, continue to plead to, the, to Governor Newsom about using his, his executive power to really uh, create changes on people who are currently in detention and, and incarcerated and how we provide more opportunities for them to be released um, and for the families that are supporting these folks that are detained, how we get resources to them as well. Um, and then, you know, on a larger advocacy level, I think funders need to come together and really um, be on the front lines with those of us on the ground that are, are leading these efforts. I know Latino Community Foundation is always, you know, arm in arm with us, but we need more. We need more funders to be joining the movement, not just from the sidelines in, in, in terms of uh, providing funding, but also leading the advocacy and speaking out about the needs and issues that are impacting our communities at this moment. Thank you, Maricela. Luz, how about you? What, what we would, what we continue advocating for, and we know it's not going to happen without our civic power this year. Although we are going through trauma and this crisis with this pandemic, but what we haven't let go as an organization is our defense. We are in a very important year. We have to continue organizing, figuring out how we're going to do it um, to, to continue organizing, making sure our youth are getting registered to vote, making sure our community is getting out to vote, and most importantly, that they vote. With the census, there's so much, there's so much at risk if our community is not participating. So we have been tripling, quadrupling down with our base because we have people power, but we don't, although we might not have money, but we have people. But we do now more than ever, we need the technology so our people could be working because we cannot be at our office sites. So uh, we, as, as we continue working towards our end goal to have, make sure that our DACA recipients have that opportunity and pathway to citizenship, to make sure that we are putting pressure and using our, flexing our political muscles, that we are making sure our community is turning out to vote in this election and so we can see change. So our end goal for immigration reform, a pathway to citizenship to more than 11 million immigrants that have, have been living, working, paying taxes. And now more than ever that we are in this crisis, they are not seeing one single penny come down from the federal government. We are calling on our Governor Newsom, all our state legislators, to pass Health for All Elders, to continue expanding Health for All for all our undocumented community. It's just the right thing to do as we continue seeing that the federal government's not gonna do nothing, but we are holding all of you all accountable that we pass the health for all elders because they are vulnerable. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. We want the KLITC for undocumented immigrants. Right now, a lot of people are filing their taxes. They never, people that file their taxes that I can have never seen no money come back. There's billions and billions of dollars in California. That's why we are such a rich and powerful state. Thanks to our immigrant community that you, that money is still in the bank creating interest. So we have so much as we continue to see people seen in detention. We hear, continue hearing people that this is expanding in our detention centers. So this, all this is very, very personal. And we hear these stories from community every day that they live in fear. And now with the pandemic, it's even worse. It's another layer of fear. So um, at this time, as we get to our end goal, we don't want to lose focus as an organization on our office our offense, making sure our community is civically engaged, making sure that you're listening to community as you're going out to vote for whoever you're gonna vote for, making sure that those people line up with your priorities. So um, this, uh, this fight is a, is a, it's a, it's a huge fight. But right now, I think as organizers, as organizations, we cannot lose focus as well on our defense strategies that the census and um, elections are going to play a significant role and um i want to share this because um this is very this is very personal last week um my uncle passed away from covid he's a catholic priest that gave his life to his community 
and we he was we weren't even we weren't able to be there by his bed when he passed because he was in isolation so this hit home this is a picture of him of his funeral service it was only two priests there us as a family we weren't even to see him they send us this picture and this is all we have from him so this is a fight that's personal and what we fear is it's getting to our community in the Inland Empire. We are seeing our Coachella community, our farm workers being exposed. Every day we're hearing deaths. So this is very close to home, very, very close to home and home. But we are in need to continue supporting our community. They're calling us, is it okay for me to go get go to the food banks? Is it okay? We're like, yes, we're kind of holding their hand and telling them these are safe spaces. So our community needs all of our organizations across the state to get their fair share because our community trusts in us to tell them it's okay to go to this center, to go to that center, to get health care. We need to protect our community and we need all of y'all support to, to use our privilege for the right thing. I'm so sorry. Maybe Jacqueline, our CEO, can also offer up a prayer for your family and for all the families that are hurting before we close. Um, I know that it takes an immense emotional toll um, to, to share openly and with your heart and to tell the truth. So we thank you from the bottom of ours for everything that you do always. We agree a thousand percent with all of your recommendation. We must be on the defense and the offense. At the Latino Community Foundation, know that we are stepping up our game as always, that we are in touch with the governor's office, that we are in touch with the media, and that we are in touch with our funders to implore them to take action and to make sure that our nurses, our farm workers, our truck drivers, our cooks, um, our janitors are not invisible, and that we use this crisis to really reimagine how we treat each other and to build a world that we are proud of, one that leaves nobody behind. There's no reason that we should be in crisis mode of this magnitude uh, right now, only after three to four weeks in the United States, the richest country in the world. Like you all said, why the economic system that we've developed, the justice system we've developed is not serving our families and we need to rethink it. Thank you for what you do. We have your back. We love you. We are raising money. Anyone who's tuning in who wants to donate, donate to the Love Not Fear Fund at the Latino Community Foundation. Send our leaders the laptops they need, the resources, unrestricted fund to them directly or via us. Um, Jacqueline, do you think you could offer up a prayer, but also close us off? Um, and thank you also for tuning in and listening. I know you're always listening to, to our partners. Masha, uh, thank you for... Uh, your leadership and making sure that we prioritize the see that Luz, Armando, Sammy, and Maricela, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for always leading the way. Thank you because you've been battling crises after the other for decades now. You run to the fire constantly, and we're so grateful for you. Um, I also wanted to say, please take care of yourselves. Um, I know that's really hard to do right now, but I need you healthy. We need you healthy and strong because you all know this is a marathon. And um, what we're beginning to see even now, the scale of suffering is going to continue, but we're building on the exasperation of inequities that you heard from Sammy and Maricela and Luz. This didn't happen overnight. What our families, the fear, the trauma, the violence, the health inequities have been in our communities far too long and now we're just making it worse. So to all our viewers right now, I just want to tell you, we're fighting two battles. There's a military term called two front war. We're fighting two wars right now, health crisis, and the economic fallout of that health crisis. On the health crisis, you've heard today how our leaders are trying to wrap their arms around our families. As some of them are suffering right now in isolation, they've been isolated for far too long because some of them are undocumented. But their rituals, the traditions that bring us together, the hugs that we give each other have been stripped away from, from us. 
and lose my family has been impacted directly. The hardest thing to do right now is to imagine going to not being able to go to a funeral for them. The things that we hold us together are being stripped away from us because of the crisis that we're facing right now. And it's also, by the way, World Health Day. And I want to say that to the 27,000 DACA recipients, 27,000 DACA recipients who are doctors and nurses, who are serving our families and our communities, and our government has yet to recognize them as citizens of this country. We salute you, we honor you, we thank you, and we see you, we love you, and we will fight to the end for you. So please stand tall because we're standing with you right now. And to all of our viewers, I just want to tell you that these organizations that you see in front of you right now that you've heard from have been battling this with, with crumbs of resources. More than 60% of our Latino-led organizations have budgets of less than half a million dollars. Yet they figure out how to bring it all together to make sure that our families have food on their table, that they have someone to rely on, that they have hope in their communities, and they keep at it when their own salaries are not enough for them to actually build a future for their own families. Enough, 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 enough of that. We have set a goal of half a million. That doesn't even compare. That's not even a drop in the bucket for what we need for the 300 plus organizations in California alone who don't have the resources to continue to serve our families. So we are imploring you, like Masha said, give directly to them. We'll, the information is on our website. Send money directly to them. And if you want to use LCF to expand your giving, then use us. Every dollar right now that's being gathered from the Love Not Fear Fund will be deployed to these organizations. And we're doing this with a sense of urgency because like you heard from Sammy, Luz, and Maricela and Armando, they've been fighting before this crisis even emerged. So I just want to thank you all for listening, for viewing, for tuning in. And I just want to say this last word to our governor and our state leaders. Just like we can lead and send 500 ventilators to the city of New York in a time of need, let's also live up to our ideals at this moment. Let's take it even further. Let's put our arms around our undocumented Californians. Let's expand the earned income tax credit to include the taxpayers, regardless of their, of their documentation, regardless of their immigration status. Let's find a way to fast track insurance coverage to our undocumented seniors. We don't have to wait to the next budget cycle. We need to have some sense of security for our families right now who've been struggling with fear. There's so much more that the state of California can do to lead by example and moral courage. Thank you, Gavin, Gavin Newsom, for leading. Now let's take it up a notch and let's send a strong message to the rest of this country and the world that California will see all of its residents and its citizens and stand with them. So I thank every single person who's viewed today. And I ask you that if you want to send this recording to friends, do it and sign up and give and give more because those of us who have a roof over our heads and food to eat tonight are privileged. And let's not exasperate the inequities that exist in our communities and in our families. It's time to end them now. Thank you, Maricela. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Luz. As Jacqueline said, we love you. We got your back. We are here. Uh, let us know what else you need. We're going to put up a slide after this um, that again shares your organization, your name, your email address, and a, uh, a link to our Love Not Fear Fund. The name also matters a great deal to us. Um, this is a time for us uh, to lead with love, as we always do, and with purpose, and with power. So we love you. We'll be in touch. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Jacqueline, I love you. Virtual hugs to you as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm.